Hello everyone. In this lecture we will be looking at everyday life and society in 18th century Europe. As this topic is so vast, we will be honing in on a number of key trends and developments in the period. But it is important to note that attempting to describe an everyday experience in Europe of the 1700s is as difficult as if one was attempting to do so for today's Europe. The first thing to note is that Europe was, and remains, a continent of vast contrasts. In general, if a travelling merchant from the time was to travel east to west, they would find their surroundings becoming gen generally more developed, with larger towns, better maintained roads and higher crop yields in the fields. The settlements they would encounter in Western Europe would themselves most likely be more cosmopolitan than their equivalents in Eastern Europe, with the notable exception being the cities of the multiracial and religiously tolerant Ottoman Empire. But as we discussed in a previous lecture, Europe was a highly localised continent, with the most important identifying feature for the vast majority of people remaining the local area, most us usually the village, that they were born and lived in. We can, to an extent, make some generalisations. Most of European society continued to be structured in a form vaguely familiar to that recognised for the last 1,000 years. Farmers, or peasants, worked the land and grew food, mostly for their own sustenance. They would then use the tiny margin of leftover food to either pay rent to a landlord, or, if they owned their own land, to sell it for a profit. A small middle class of merchants would facilitate this commerce, as well as shifting valuable goods, like salt, to places where it was needed. In the towns, guilds were responsible for the creation of manufactured goods such as tools. At the top of society, a small noble strata, descended from long lines of, an, of an ancient warrior class, owned most of the land and the wealth. Life as a farmer was extremely tough, especially for the vast majority of peasants who did not own their own land. The average life expectancy in 18th century England was roughly 40 years, although adults managing to somehow make it to 30 often lived for another two decades. In other parts of Europe, life expectancy and infant mortality were higher. The main goal most people hoped to achieve in life was simply to survive, and indeed the population of most European states barely grew between 1600 and 1800 before experiencing an explosion after that date. Europe remained in the grip of the so-called Little Ice Age, with brutal winters and small crop yields. Houses, often windowless, contained one or two rooms, and their residents slept under the same roof as their animals, on beds made out of straw. Personal effects, such as cutlery, were extremely rare. A sudden change in local conditions, such as a famine or a trade depression, were enough, was enough sorry, to throw thousands of locals into absolute destitution, and most often, death. Nonetheless, life for an average farmer in 1789 was better than it had been in 1700, and immeasurably better than it had been in 1600. One reason for this was the so-called Columbian Exchange, in which crops native to North America, such as tomatoes, peppers and beans, began to be cultivated in Europe, diversifying the diet of the European poor. In particular, it was the humble potato that was the real champion Grown underground, potatoes were able to be cultivated in great numbers in dark northern Europe, becoming a lifeline for millions of peasants from Ireland to the Baltic. Another crop, cotton, allowed for a steady increase in the amount of clothing available for the European poor, who now began to own two, or maybe even three, different outfits. The availability of cotton to make these clothes was a direct result of the exploitation of African slaves forced by European settlers to grow and pick the crop in British, French and Portuguese colonies in North America. The changes in the lives of the poor 
affected Eastern Europe more slowly. In fact, peasants in Eastern Europe experienced a relative loss in the standard of their lives during the 18th century, as more and more fell into serfdom, particularly in Russia. Serfs were not allowed to sell their food, either for rent or profit, but rather were forced to work directly for the local nobility. For most of the year, the serf farmed a patch of land. They could also be mobilised for other tasks a noble had need of, and were required to give their labour for these tasks for a certain number of days a year. Serfs in Russia did not have freedom of movement, and were only allowed to leave their village with their lord's permission, which the lord rarely granted. Women farmers and peasants shared many of the same problems as the men, with extra hardships included. Women were responsible for raising children and preparing them for a life of work. On top of this, they were responsible for cooking and feeding the family, maintaining an expert knowledge of herbs and plants, and developing needlework skills to repair clothes. Mothers were expected to have many children because not that many children were able to survive early childhood. Around 12-13% to 13% of children would die during the first year of their lives. Those children who did survive began working very early on in life, sometimes even as early as age 7. They worked mostly on the farms or left home to look for a future as apprentices. Daughters of these families remained home, often aiding their mothers around the house until they found a husband and started a family of their own. The oldest son of each family would also stay home in order to inherit the family farm. A major reason for high levels of infant mortality was disease. Disease, particularly measles and typhus, was a common factor of life for Europeans and was encouraged by terrible standards of hygiene. Farmers and townsfolk alike washed infrequently and thought nothing of being covered in lice and fleas. Giant dung piles towered over the centre of villages. The darkness and smokiness of interior, interior locations encouraged bronchitis and other ailments. Women continued to play a vital role in rural societies as healers. Their traditional medicines were effective up to a point, but could do nothing to prevent widespread outbreaks of disease from constantly erupting. On a better note, both the bubonic and pneumonic plagues became rare with no major outbreaks of the plague occurring after 1740. Perhaps because of the ever-present threat of death, the afterlife and religion were extremely important. Christianity was the domin dominant force in most of Europe. The clergy, particularly in Catholic countries, owned large tracts of often valuable land, and the highest echelons of the church retained the immense wealth that it had accrued over centuries. On the other hand, a legion of poorer clergymen were vital in protecting some of the weakest in society, providing much needed arms. However, the church also preached of the blessed state of the poor and the sanctity of poverty, and so helped to squash any attempts at self-improvement and class advancement. Religious toleration was the exception, not the rule. Catholics were targeted as agents of the Pope by suspicious Protestants. Whilst the Protestant populations of France and Spain were almost entirely deported from their country and forbidden from practicing their religion, a rise in anti-Protestant and Orthodox sentiment began to be seen in Poland-Lithuania, traditionally a tolerant state. Jewish Europeans continued to be heavily discriminated against, and subject to occasional pogroms. We will cover their situation in more detail in future lectures. The Ottoman Empire was an exception to its neighbours. Islam, not Christianity, was the religion of the Ottoman ruler, the Caliph, and of the state's extensive bureaucracy. However, religious toleration was practised in the empire and its European regions were overwhelmingly Christian. Jewish communities were also allowed to practice their faith in relative peace. Christians did not sorry, Christians did have to pay extra taxes, and rising through the ranks of the administration was difficult without conversion to Islam. 
The 1700s saw an increase in number of Europeans fleeing rural poverty by moving to the towns and cities, especially in Great Britain and in Italy. Conditions in these cities continued to be horrific. Paris did not even cover its sewer until the 1740s, with the most powerful European country literally having a river of waste flowing into the Seine. Alcoholism was common, with gin consumption in London being infamous until a tax was introduced on the spirit. Outside of medieval city walls, large shanty towns grew up, consisting of all of those unable to afford the exorbitant rents. These shanty towns, such as Bethnal Green in London, often developed into working class districts of their own right over the following century. Riots would often break out following a rise in the price of bread, some of the most violent being in Genoa in 1746, when the poor reclaimed the entire city from Austrian invaders. Naples was the most overcrowded city, exploding in size in the late 18th century as a result of pe peasant refugees fleeing from the countryside. Constantinople, or Istanbul, half, situa half situated in Asia, remained the largest city and was unique in its diversity and energy. London was beginning to catch up, growing ever more rapidly and surpassing 1.2 million inhabitants by the end of the century. Alongside the gradual growth in cities, a European middle class was growing and becoming more assertive. This middle class, the precursor to the bourgeoisie, was defined by the hard work which separated it from the nobility, and the ownership of pro property and relative financial security which separated it from the poor. The most prosperous members of the middle class were the merchants who had made absolute fortunes in trading slaves and spices. These merchants heavily invested in their local areas. The British cities of Liverpool and Bristol, for example, were largely built on money earned in the slave trade. Next came the bankers, who were a relatively closed profession, although money lenders were present in every rural village and provided a vital service in keeping peasants afloat in difficult times. Lawyers were increasingly frequent, but the practice of law remained an extremely corrupt one. Trades in the urban centres continued to be dominated by guilds, who set exact prices for goods and heavily restricted the amount of work available. These guilds increasingly closed ranks, fearful of the rise of unemployed and the clamour for work and cheaper goods in the cities they lived in. The European elite, the aristocracy, was defined above all by its ownership of land. Land was far more prestigious than money, and indeed it was looked, upon, looked down upon for nobles to take any form of employment whatsoever. In France, nobles even lost their status if they took a job. In Prussia, by contrast, Frederick the Great made all nobles join either the army or the administration, giving the Prussian bureaucracy a status and prestige it lacked in other countries. Moreover, not all nobles owned land. In Poland, where 10% of the population were nobles, it was common to see landless nobility, it was more common to see landless nobility than in Western Europe. Succession laws were complex and the source of much feuding and intrigue, although in some societies, such as Great Britain, the eldest son simply inherited everything. Whereas the nobles traditionally believed politics to be almost beneath them, leaving such matters to the king and his court, by the late 18th century they were participating in policy making in ever greater numbers. This accelerated the hatred of the nobility felt by the poor. While on the whole nobles were reactionary and increasingly sought to resist change and preserve their wealth and power, they also patronised the arts and culture. Great works of art, music and philosophy were funded through the money given by noble patrons. The great European Baroque and Rococo styles in many ways reflected the desires and self-belief of the noble class. Perhaps the most important aspect of the nobility was its cosmopolitan attitude. Nobles from Ireland to Russia travelled the breadth of Europe, communicating with each other and sharing each other's culture and interests. They used French as a language of communication and followed the latest trends in, fashion in Paris, undoubtedly 
europe's cultural capital with fascination.